When God's name comes up, there's so many different things that we think. God can sometimes feel like he's so far away, like he's letting us handle life on our own. But as we look through the Bible and we look at the nature of God, we see the different people and different relationships with God and there's a simple theme about God's side of our relationship. His love pursues our hearts. His grace pursues our faults and his hope pursues our doubt. God is active, God is alive, and God is aware. You are pursued. Hey, uh, good morning, you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Heart. My name is Dominic. I'm the leader uh, here at this church, this community, this group of people, this mess that we're in, uh, that we're all in together. And I want to say real quick, before we get uh, cooking into the message that uh, if it's your first time at church, or maybe your uh, first time at church in a long time, and maybe you've been burned by uh, people at church, church people, don't get me started on church people, or maybe you've been burned by somebody like me, somebody who is, you know, preaching something or, or, or shared a message with you, and um, and, it, and it just and it just messed up your life or whatever. I want to let you know that this is a safe place right where you're at right now. It's a safe place to be where you are on your journey of faith. Even if you're you're mad at God and you're uh, just trying to take a first step back into uh, getting to know him again or whatever it is, um, that here at the heart, we believe when we say things like you belong here and we mean it, we mean that you belong here no matter where you are, that you don't have to follow a certain set of rules or guidelines to be able to hang out with us. You don't even have to go to church here to go to church here. You can be wherever you are on your journey of faith. And and I'm grateful that you're here this morning. I believe that if you let yourself, if you open up your heart a little bit, you let yourself hear the message today, I believe you'll walk out of here with a new perspective on what it means to be loved by God. Now, we are, uh, we're in a message series called Pursued, and, and the way we do it is, uh, it's not necessarily different from other churches, but we have a particular topic or a concept that we talk through over four, five, six weeks. And what we're, what we're looking at here is what it means to be pursued by God. So I started this whole thing, this whole message series off with one simple concept that I was going to incept you with, okay, and I was going to put it, just plant it in the back of your brain, and that concept, that thought, that idea is that you are pursued by God. And if you've seen uh, the movie Inception before, it's not going to work because I'm telling you that I'm going to incept you with it, so if you've never seen it, don't worry about it. came out about 10 years ago. You are pursued by God. Now, that sounds great. That sounds really, really nice. It sounds very inspiring. Sounds like something you could tell people if they're having a hard time. Hey, don't, don't forget, you're pursued by God. But I think it only matters, it only matters if we can understand what that means for us. Right? It only matters that you being pursued by God if it affects your life. Same thing with the scriptures. And we can read through the Bible. You can read through the Bible and you can memorize scriptures. But if we're only looking at it as an ancient book, as letters and poems from 2,000 years ago, and we never see how it can apply into our lives today, then we're missing out on so much. So if we don't dig into a concept like this of us being pursued by God, if we don't dig into it and say, why does that matter? Why does it matter if we are pursued by God that we are missing out on so much? So that's what we've done over the last couple of weeks is we've tried to dig into why it matters, what it means for you in your real life right now, in your marriage, in your business, in your finances. Why does it matter that you are pursued by God? So I want to dig into a little bit of that today as well. And later on, we're going to be in a couple scriptures. We're going to be in the book of Jonah. That's a fun read, Jonah. It's in the Old Testament first part of your Bible. And then we're going to look at James. That's in, the, that's in the New Testament, the second part of your Bible. And we're going to look at what it means to trust God and how that connects to his pursuit of you. Now, for those of you that don't really know me that well, I have a, I have a son, 16 years old, and, uh, and he's about all of 16. You know what I mean? Um, any parents in here? Any parents? Any parents of of uh, kids, okay. Anybody, anybody here have parents? Anybody in here have parents? Okay, okay. So these are my people, okay. You're connecting with me. 
So I have, I have a son, he's saying, and I have full permission from him today to tell the stories I'm going to tell you, okay, if that gives you an indication of where we might be going. <laughs> uh, me and Corbin, Corbin is his name, we have a great time together. We have so much fun, we laugh all the time, you know, we, we both love basketball, so we're watching Spurs games all the time, and uh, you know, all kinds of basketball games, and we're just talking trash, and we're giving Greg Popovich, you know, tips on how to coach from our couch, you know what I mean, like we know anything about basketball. Uh, and we just have a great time all the time. But there's sometimes when I ask Corbin to do something, can you guess what happens? He doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. Now, I would appreciate the attitude of them doing it, right? But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. I'll say something like, hey, can you walk your dog? It's Saturday. It's, let's say it's Saturday. Hey, can you walk the dog? Goes to walk the dog. And then it'll be Thursday of the following week. Corbin, when's the last time you walked your dog? I know the answer. You know what I mean? It was Saturday. <laughs> and I'll say, Corbin, every day. Your dog needs a walk every day, right? Every day. Every day. So then I'll, then I'll, you know, then I'll get sassy, like, oh, you want to go play basketball at the park? I don't think so. Didn't you play on Saturday? You don't need to go then. <laughs> and then we have this joke now, too, because uh, my love language is acts of service, okay? If you don't know what it is, like, the best way to make me feel loved is when, like, Amber or Corbin, or, you know, my parents or whoever, they do something for me. That makes me feel loved. Because you can give me gifts, and I love gifts. Love, look, gifts are great but it doesn't make me feel loved like if you were to take the trash out for me, right? That's kind of how, like, I, I f when somebody helps me, I feel like, wow, they really, they really see me. They really know me. They really love me. And so I'll, I'll ask, you know, I'll ask, and Corbin knows this, so when I ask him to do something, he's like, oh, you want me to do that right now? So I'll say, hey, can you take out the trash today? And he goes, you want me to do that right now? And I'm like, no, 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 I mean, you know, well, today, I want you to take out the trash out today. Okay, so right now? <laughs> I'll say, you know, take it out whenever, just today, right? You want me to take it out right now? <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But there's some days I ask him to do something, he doesn't do it. I say, why didn't you do it? I forgot. Sometimes he forgets. Sometimes he doesn't do it. Now, I could tell you these stories, and I have many stories like this. And I could frame this and tell these stories in a way where you would see Corbin as disobedient, right? It is disobedient. If I say, here's what I want you to do, and when I want you to do it, and he doesn't do it, that is the definition of disobedience, right? So I could paint this picture of my son, who has a loving father, so generous, so giving, so handsome, you know, not my words, these are his words. <laughs> but I could paint the picture for you that he is a disobedient son. I just have, right? I ask him to do something, he doesn't do it, he's disobedient. And I want to look at a story today that if we glance at it and we just read the text, we just read the story, we see, wow, this is disobedience. This is disobedience, and I wonder what God's going to do. Ooh, don't, get, don't be disobedient around God. You're supposed to be obedient. You need to obey God, obey God's commands. It's all over the Bible. Obey God's commands, obey what God says to do. So I want to look at the story of Jonah. Now, before we get into the scriptures we're going to look at, I, I want to just give you like the, 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 the quickest Cliff's Notes version, Dom's version of the story of Jonah, if you don't know about it. So Jonah was a man. He was a prophet, okay? And back, back, in, the, back in the old days, a prophet was someone who would deliver God's message. They would say, thus saith the Lord, give a message, and you would take it to the bank. That thou, Those were the words of Yahweh. Those were the words of Jehovah. Those were the words of the living Hebrew God. And Jonah was one of these people. So God asked Jonah, Jonah he wants Jonah to deliver a message to this city called Nineveh. The city, they, they were a mess. They weren't following God. All kinds of murderous rage, craziness happened over there. It was just a mess. And God wanted Jonah to deliver a message to them that they needed to change their ways or there was going to be some bad things happening. And Jonah runs the other way. Nineveh's this way. Jonah gets in a ship and he goes the other way. He's running away from what God wants him to do. 
And I think throughout this story, maybe, maybe for yourself, I, I know for me, I can kind of relate to some of the things that Jonah does, some of the actions that Jonah takes, some of the things that Jonah says. I can relate to it because there's some times where I feel like if God, if there's something that God wants me to do that I don't want to do, I'll be like, huh? Yeah, got my earbuds in. What'd you say? Right, Jonah goes the other way. And so God, you know, God knows he's going the other way. So God sends a storm, and the storm is, you know, rocking the boat back and forth. The guys that are taking Jonah, that they're driving the ship, or <laughs> however, however ships work, you know what I mean? That they're shifting gears, or you know what I mean? I don't know how, I don't know how boating worked back then. They're, you know, what do we, what do we do? What do we do? Why, why is there this crazy storm? And Jonah says, I know why there's a storm, because God sent the storm because I'm going the wrong way. Just throw me overboard. Jonah wants to die. Jonah would rather die <laughs> than do what God wants him to do. <laughs> and I think, I think what, we're, what we'll find, if you read the story, you've got to read the story. Jonah would rather die because he can't stand the Ninevites. He doesn't even want them to have a chance to know who God is. I wonder why. So they throw him overboard, and the storm stops immediately. Everything's fine. And Jonah was like, finally I can die and not do this terrible thing that God wants me to do. So a fish comes up and swallows up Jonah. But what Jonah doesn't know is that fish is not there to swallow him up, eat him, and kill him. That fish is there to deliver him to where God needs him to be. That fish is there to take him to exactly where God wants him. And in this fish, I wonder if Jonah thinks he's going to die because he has this prayer. The, you know, the book of Jonah it delivers this prayer that Jonah had where he thanks God for hearing him when he cries out. But he never apologizes for disobeying God. And now that I think about it, I don't know if Corbin's ever apologized to me for disobeying me. I don't know if that's ever happened. Apology accepted. So the fish spits him out. Maybe you know the story. The fish spits him out right at the feet of Nineveh, right at the city where he's supposed to be. God says, this is where I need you to be. I need you to do this. And Jonah says, fine, I will deliver this message. So Jonah walks to the city, he gets to the city, and this is in verses, uh, I think, 3 through 5. He gets to the city, and it's a huge city. It takes three days to walk across. So he first enters the city, he walks a third of the way in, and this is, this is the heartwarming, gospel, God loves you message he delivers. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. <laughs> in 40 days... Another translation says, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. In Christ's name, Jonah. From your loving, from your loving Savior. <laughs> That's what he delivers. That's the message he delivers. Watch what happens. The people of Nineveh, they listened and trusted God. They proclaimed the citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. Another translation says, even the cows, the animals, repented before God. I don't know how cows repent, but the point is, everyone in the city changed their ways. Everyone in the city listened and trusted God. If you hear, if we hear what God says and we don't act on it, if we're hearing from God and don't act on it, it's not really quite hearing. It's like the difference between hearing and listening. Like maybe you can hear me talking, but are you listening to what I'm saying? I, I, I have before, maybe you have where you say, God, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you about this situation. I need to hear from you about this mess I'm in. I need to hear from you about my marriage. I need to hear from you about this job I need. I need to hear from you about this school I'm going to. I need to hear from you for this next step in my life. But then we don't listen. We ask to hear from God. We need to hear from God, but we don't listen because we're so busy. We don't listen because we're so worried about making the wrong decision that we control everything and say, well, I'm just going to make these decisions on my own. So the people changed their lives. And Jonah, disobedient again, he is so bothered. He is so angry. He is so angry that God would forgive these people. He is so angry that God would change his anger, his wrath, the fire he was going to bring down, the way he was going to Hulk smash Nineveh. He is so angry that he changed that to forgiveness. He is so bothered by that. 
And if you're reading the story, you might be confused on why he's bothered by it. And you wouldn't be alone because God is confused on why Jonah is so bothered by that. In fact, the rest of the story goes, Jonah walks out of the city, and he's hoping, he's praying that the people will repent from their repentance. He's hoping that they will see, that they, will, they, will, they will think it's an error, and they will go back to living the way that they live so God can rain fire down. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what Jonah hates so much about these people. Maybe because these people have no idea what it takes to have a strong relationship with God. God can just forgive them? Oh, no, 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 no. We have rules. We have laws. You have to be circumcised. You have to remember the Ten Commandments. You think you just skate in unforgiveness? I don't think so. Who do these people think they are? All they have to do is say they're sorry and God forgives them? I don't like that. No, no, no. They, they're, not, they're not following the right rules. These people don't know about the Ten Commandments yet. These people don't know how we do things at my church. These people don't know that they're not supposed to drink or cuss. These people don't know that they're not supposed to watch rated R movies. They don't know any of that yet. So how could they possibly be getting a glimpse of who God is if they don't know those things? Maybe that's what's gotten Jonah so riled up. Jonah doesn't want God to pursue these people. In Jonah's eyes, they are not worthy of God's pursuit. How could they be? The whole city all of their lives, have been doing things against God's nature, against what God wants them to do, against God's law. I think we've got Jonah so riled up, so he goes out of the city, and he's piping mad. He's probably stomping, you know. Anybody have teenagers, you know what I mean? I used to, I used to be a stomper. You make it clear that you're mad, so you stomp up the stairs, you stomp away. I'm sure Jonah stomped up this hill just waiting for the city of Nineveh to change their, change their minds. They could go back to being burned. And God sees Jonah. He's like, man, this guy's out here. It's hot outside. I'm going to give him a tree. So in a day, a tree grows, gives Jonah shade. And Jonah's very pleased by the tree. He appreciates the tree. And the next day, God takes away the tree. And, God, and Jonah's angry again. He's angry again. Jonah's got a problem, am I right? Yikes. So he gets angry. And God asks him, so it's okay for you to go from being pleased to quickly being angry in one day because of a tree, but it's not okay for me to go from being angry to pleased, to change my mind. Because it it says in here, over 120,000 people have changed their ways. Why is it okay for you to change your mind and not okay for me to change mine? Powerful, powerful story. And I think at first glance, if we read this, what we see, what we might see is that we're like Jonah, that we're disobedient, that there's something that God wants us to do. Maybe there's something that God wants you to do. Maybe there's someone that God wants you to be kind to, and you're not being kind to them. That's disobedient. Maybe, maybe, there, maybe there's something that you're, say to, you're supposed to say to somebody to encourage them, and you didn't say it because you're mad at them. That is being disobedient. Maybe it's something that you read in the Bible that it says a follower of Jesus should do. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus, and there's something in the Bible that says a follower of Jesus should do, and you're not doing it. That is disobedient. Watch out. You don't want to be around God. You wouldn't like God when he's angry. You wouldn't want to be around God when you're being disobedient. But it seems like every character in this story, (laughs) except God, has been disobedient. Every character, Jonah to the Ninevites to the cows, apparently, have been disobedient. But God looks on them. And he sees them. And he chooses to pursue them. He chooses to pursue Jonah, and he chooses to pursue the Ninevites. I I, I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget it. God wants you to hear what he says more than he wants you to do what he says. God wants you to hear what he's saying more than he wants you to do what he's saying. Because you can follow the rules. You can do exactly what God needs you to do. But obedience only matters if it comes from your heart. Obedience only matters. It only means something if it comes from your heart. If obedience doesn't come from your heart, then you're missing the relationship. 
If obedience doesn't come from your heart, then you're just checking off boxes. You're just, not, you're just knocking out a task list. If you're just coming to church because you think you're supposed to, and you're giving because you think you're supposed to, and you're serving because you think you're supposed to, and you're going to group because you think you're supposed to, and you're not doing any of those things out of your heart, then what can they possibly do for you? We talked a few weeks ago about God's pursuit needs to be seen. Because if you don't see God's pursuit, if you don't see God pursuing you, then how can you know that he loves you? How could you possibly know? And so I look at this and I see, okay, well, what, what's the difference here? What's the difference between Jonah, this man who was, who was born to deliver God's message, who had the power, the gift to hear from God and deliver it to people so people could hear God's voice? being disobedient. What's the difference between this guy and these people over here, the Ninevites, who have not been doing what they were supposed to do their whole lives? And they get a glimpse of heaven. They get a glimpse of God's pursuit. And as soon as they get a glimpse of God's pursuit, what happens? They change everything. They change everything. What's the difference? What's the difference between Jonah and these people? Because it's the same God. It's the same love. Right? It's the same message. Why are there so completely different views on what God is doing? God is offering love and grace to people. Jonah has a problem with it, and the Ninevites find freedom in it. How is that possible? I'll tell you what it is. There's one difference. There's one difference between these two. The difference between God controlling you See, in Jonah's eyes, like God's telling him what to do, and he feels like maybe controlled. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to do it. Some of us are so good at obeying when it's something that we want to do, right? Don't tell me what to do unless it's something I want to do, and then I'll entertain it, obviously. The difference between God controlling you and God pursuing you is trust. Your trust for what God says is the difference between him controlling you and him pursuing you. I want to read the book of, it's in the book of James, it's the New Testament. This book, it's more of a letter. It's a letter, and when you read it, it reads more like a sermon or like a message about wisdom and how to live out our faith. But I want to read this particular, this particular part that has to do with the way we live our life. Check this out. This is James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. If you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like the person who looks in the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. You perceive how God sees you in the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget your divine origin. Hearing what God says and not acting on it is like looking in the mirror and then turning around and you forget what you look like. But those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty are fascinated by and respond to the truth they hear and are strengthened by it. They experience God's blessing in all that they do. Look at that. The perfecting law of liberty. I'm going to oversimplify what the law means. If you were Hebrew... If you were from Israel, if you were following the living God, the Hebrew God, and there was one thing that drove everything that you did, everything that you acted upon, and that was the law. Can you imagine there being anything more important than the law that God delivered to Moses on the mountain? Can you imagine there being anything more important on how to live your life day to day than the law that was given to you? That was the perfect law, God's perfect law. But this language is different. The law of liberty. Because here's what happened. Jesus came and he said, that is the law. And you guys might be following the rules, but here's what the law means. What Jesus wants people to see in the rules is the love that God wants us to have for others through that. That's why I say that God wants us to hear what he says more than he wants us to do what he says. 
perfecting law of liberty. Another way they say that is the royal law of love. Jesus wants us to see love in the law. And if you can see love and you can act out in love, do you need to memorize the law? We see God's pursuit when we choose to trust him. And that's what the Ninevites did. They chose to trust. My, uh, my disobedient son, uh, Will, you can come on up. My disobedient son, Corbin. There's probably a few stories when I said, hey, can you do something? And he remembered to do it and did it. There's probably some. Can you imagine how rocky our relationship would be if my love for him was based on him obeying me? Can you imagine how, how, how in trouble this relationship would be if I said, Corbin, I, I love you and I want to keep loving you. Oh, I just need you to obey my rules, bro. I need you to do what I say when I say to do it so I can love you. Why don't you want me to love you? Just do what I say. Would that make any sense to you? Would that make any sense to you? In fact, I've seen some parents, I've known people where their goal is obedience with their kids. They want their kids to be obedient. And you can meet some of the most well-behaved kids you've ever met. But here's my goal. My goal is not for Corbin to obey me. My goal is for us to have a relationship so when he moves out, when he's 18, when he moves out at 25, when are you moving out? I can't remember. When he moves out, I want him to be able to come back. I want him to value our relationship that he wants to come back. But if my goal is obedience, then I can get him to obey. I can put the fear in him. I can make him do what I want him to do. But if I do that, if my goal is obedience, you know what I sacrifice? The relationship. Because you don't need to trust God to obey. You don't need to trust uh, your boss to follow the rules. Right? You don't need to trust your parents to do what they say. But you do need trust if you want a heart connection. You do need to trust God if you want to be able to see his pursuit of you. Because he was pursuing Jonah, but Jonah didn't see that. Jonah just got angry because he was doing something he didn't want to do. God was pursuing the Ninevites, and the Ninevites saw that. They heard, and they trusted My son and I, 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 I love hugs. I'm a hugger, okay? I love hugs. I love warm hugs. <laughs> and I love to give Corbin hugs, but he doesn't love hugs. It's fine. I don't take it personally. Sometimes. And so sometimes I can get him to hug me. There, there's a special time, 10 minutes before he goes to bed and 10 minutes after he wakes up, where he's kind of tired. And then we hug. I just love hugging him. And there's sometimes, we call it a funny business hug. And a funny business hug is, we're going to hug, but then I'm probably going to tickle him or wrestle him or funny business. So sometimes he has to say to me, Dad, okay, I'll give you a hug, but no funny business, right? No shenanigans. And that's, okay, fine, fine. Excuse me. Right? Sometimes it's like, okay, well, we can have a funny business hug. We can wrestle. But here's the deal. Here's what comes from trust. It's because I trust him to tell me what he's really thinking. And he trusts me to tell him what I'm really thinking. So if he says he doesn't want to wrestle, then I can obey that. See that? The goal is not obedience, but obedience comes out of trust. Because he can, he can do exactly what I tell him to do. But if he's doing it out of fear and not trust, and there's no relationship, that's not real. When we get here on Sunday morning, let me tell you this. I'm going to brag on him for a little bit. This isn't about church. This is just about what he said he wants to do. Sunday mornings, he, he's got his own alarm. He wakes up at 6 a.m. I don't wake him up. He gets his stuff ready. He gets some of the stuff for the church ready, packs it all up in the car. I don't tell him to do that. We go and get tacos for the team and some coffee. 
we get here and we start setting up, I don't have to tell him what to go set up. He just goes and does that. When he goes out with people, he'll regularly offer to buy people's coffee or to buy their meals. When me and him go hang out, sometimes he'll offer to buy my lunch. Now, now, would I be able to see any of that? Would I be able to see any of that if I was just looking for his obedience? No, because I would be blinded by all the times he has disobeyed me. I'd be blinded by all the times he didn't do what I said. Yeah, you helped, you know, put the, set up the church. Big whoop. What about that thing I asked you to do yesterday? Didn't do it. Thought so. Can you imagine if that's what our relationship was like? But since the goal is trust, since the goal is a heart-to-heart connection, then I don't see the disobedience for what it is because you know what? Sometimes he forgets. You ever forgot something? What's my name? (laughs) I got you. Sometimes he has a bad day. Sometimes he's tired. I've been tired. I've had bad days. Sometimes I forget. So those things don't get in the way of our relationship. But that's what I want you to see. That's what I want you to know. Is that your obedience or disobedience is not what God is looking for. God doesn't let that get in the way of his relationship with you. God doesn't let that get in the way of his pursuit of you. If disobedience got in the way of God's pursuit of us, then Jonah is in bad shape. Then the Ninevites are in bad shape. You know why? Because they're not obeying God. They're not doing anything. They're just sorry. (laughs) That's all. They're just sorry. They didn't start handing out Bibles and start church services and, you you know, small groups and everything else. They were just sorry. They were sorry, and they wanted to connect with God, and they saw God's pursuit, and it changed everything. Trusting God shows us his pursuit. Oh, I love me so hard.